in a world where Microsoft virtualization is still considered to be the underdog by some. The Hyper-V Amigos enlighten the IT crowds on how they could very well be mistaken. So, this is the second episode of, of the Hyper-V Amigo podcast and I have a guest who is very well known, to me at least, and I think most of my listeners, Didier van Hooye from Belgium. Hi Didier, how are you? Hello Karsten, Happy New Year! <laughs> Happy New Year, same to you. And congrats to your fifth MVP award. You got it Thank you two much. days ago, right? Yes, on the January the 1st, I got that very nice email that I've been renewed. And of course, this is the first email that stated the new uh, designation, which is Cloud and Data Center Management. Okay. Were you nervous to get it? Be honest. Always a little bit. <laughs> you, Maybe. You, know, you, you always think like, yeah, yeah, okay, this, this, yeah, probably, yeah, but until you, until you know, you don't know, right? I mean, yeah, but they have a little glitch on the website, or you know that? <laughs> yes, I know they have a little glitch on the website, but so every you're... year, every year they could have fixed that glitch, my friend. Yeah, but if you see the fifth, <laughs> the fifth of what there, yeah. But uh, this is leading right into my first question. So uh, my first question question would be, who are you, and why do we know each other? Oh, who am I? A philosophical <laughs> question, that is. Uh, no. So, my name is DJ Van Hooyen. Uh, I might be better known to the rest of the world as working hard in IT because of my blog and my Twitter handle. Yeah. So, I tend to, you know, deliver the, the thoughts and my opinions on all things concerning IT and virtualization storage networking on my blog and via Twitter. I'm also active in the, the community as it is known, uh, both locally and globally. So that's how we know each other, right? We, we started uh, meeting each other online, but also in real life at a conference. I think the first time we ever met in real life was at, uh, uh, was it was E3? It in was it in London uh, or was it in, in, in Frankfurt? I'm not quite sure. You were not an MVP, I know that. Yes. I may have got my first award, but I'm, I'm not really sure. But I, it was... I think so. I think so. You had gotten your first award recently at that yeah. moment, uh, but I do not know whether our first interview together... I think it was on a was it was, with, was on, with very, a very windy. You remember yes, that maybe that was in Frankfurt. That was in Frankfurt. Uh, Frankfurt. Yes. Yeah. And then the second one we met in real life was in London at the yeah. yeah. In 2011, right? 2011. Yes. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah. So we know each other now for about five years. It was a, a bit more than five years, but it was a journey. We have uh, done some things together, some videos, some episodes of the Hyper-V Amigo showcast, uh, and we were a little bit lazy the last, the last half year. That's primarily, primarily my fault because I had not so I preferred. Time. I prefer the term, we were busy. We were busy, yeah, we were very busy and uh, could do that. Uh, uh, but uh, we will do more episodes in, uh, in 2016. There is we new has, stuff to talk to about. So. Yeah. yeah, that's we great. So, so, yeah, you are an, an MVP. You were a Hyper-V MVP and uh, now you are one of the cloud and data center management MVPs, right? As I am. Um, yes. But I, I would like to be a Hyper-V MVP. <laughs> well, you know, deep in your heart, we're all <laughs> still Hyper-V MVPs. I'm still but of course, I mean, perhaps we as Hyper-V MVPs, and I'm going to tout our own, you know, uh, qualities here, <laughs> are very well placed to be cloud and data center MVPs. That's right. Because when you do virtualization, you touch the entire stack. That's right. Networking, storage, compute, you touch data protection, you backups, uh, restores, you touch uh, security, both uh, physical security as uh, logical security, be it antivirus or firewalls, uh, intrusion detection system. Actually, virtualization is a real broad spectrum technology. That's right. So in that respect, I think, 
cloud and data center management is befitting a Hyper-V MVP. And there's one other nice thing. We are in the private cloud. We are yes. in the public cloud, at least at Microsoft. It's a Azure cloud. It's based on Hyper-V. And we are the hosters. So we can work in every space. It's very nice. We are everywhere. We are everywhere. Right. Okay. Um, so, Didier, uh, I, um, I have a question for you uh, that is, I think, going to the past, a uh, long time ago. And I want to oh, know God. when you actually started with IT. Do you know when it when it was and what it was that uh, got you in IT? Uh, yeah, I think we've mentioned this briefly in one of our early uh, showcasts, uh, but only briefly. Basically, it was a combination of the fact that I, I needed to find something to do because by training I am a, a biologist and, a, and more of a lab biologist than a, than a let's say, a field biologist. Uh, and at, in those times there wasn't really that much work, so I needed to find something else to do. Uh, I have a brother-in-law who had a couple of IT firms in his career, in his life, and he said, this is something for you, really. And at that moment in time, I didn't really believe him. Okay. Because I was like, I don't know that much about it. But he says you're smart and you learn fast and you like to, you're inquisitive. Yeah, it just just do something. So he let me do some things, and I thought I was awful at it. But he said, no, no, that's okay. Uh, and uh, with that experience and the fact that I got a job where I could start automating stuff, uh, I turned into a VBA developer actually at the beginning of my career. Okay. And so I wrote code, and uh, in the beginning, it's always like you're trying to make things work. But when, once you, you, you get to the point that you can get things to work, uh, if it's in your nature, you want to improve things and do things as they should be done by design and with some formality and some architecture. So you start learning and you become a developer, a real developer, and you start learning and learning. But as a developer, using networking, compute, storage, I always became frustrated with the quality of the infrastructure around me. And at a certain moment, I switched jobs, and I came in there generally to be in IT. But uh, let's say the focus at, at the moment I arrived was on development, and I was developing code. But that frustration with the infrastructure was again, present. So at a given moment, I said to my d direct supervisor, basically the boss also, look, this this is not good. We need to fix this. I'm going to stop coding for a while. I'm just going to fix this first, and then we'll start coding again. Well, I've been fixing infrastructure and improving infrastructure ever since that day. Uh, so basically, that's how I ended up doing uh, uh, data center infrastructure and uh, you know, Hyper-V virtualization, that sort of stuff. It's kind kind of a fun way around. The good thing is, I've 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 done a lot of things in in IT, right? Scripting, development, databases, co uh, all the coding, not everything, but a lot of coding. I did networking, storage, servers, virtualization, backups. So you get this broad context about what makes IT work. So that tunnel vision a lot of people seem to have uh, about, you know, it's all easy and I just click the button and it should work. And why the hell can't I get uh, a sub millisecond response if I ask for 10 terabytes of data from a database over VPN? What, what, is, what is wrong with this shitty technology? That sort of mentality I've never had because basically you've used and tried to implement a broad spectrum of, this, of the infrastructure stack, and you just realize life isn't as easy as some people think it is. You know, <laughs> this basically, I know what you mean. if I would have to, to condense that into one single sentence, it would be that this shit doesn't just work. <laughs> That's it, right. That's there right. is a lot of stuff involved in making this shit work. It's great if you can get to the point where the consumers, the, the users of that technology, don't need to worry about all that, and that the experience they have is uh, acceptable or even very good to them. But it also helps if the people involved in getting there uh, at least have an understanding on how to achieve achieve that and what their what their part in the contribution to that goal should be. Because from an end user ex, uh, 
perspective, I can understand that they say, hey, I clicked this button and this is not what I want, right? Yeah. I want something better, something faster. But when I meet people in IT who have the same uh, attitude and behavior, I'm like, hey, I, I, I hold you to a higher standard than that. <laughs> you are not the end user here, right? You are one of the IT professionals or developers who has to make this happen. And it would help tremendously if you would have some idea about all the challenges and uh, limitations but also capabilities certain technologies have and sometimes I find that a bit lacking in some of the people I meet in my line of work <laughs> okay did you uh, so I I got you started as a biologist and changed yeah. job to or to study of uh, I think biology right Yep, 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 yep. And then I, you a, I have a master's degree in biology. That's nice. And then you changed to IT because there was no work. Um, this this is where your professional IT career started. Have you played with IT or with computers before that? So as a kid maybe? Or when, has, when did you first contact or, or, um, or use the computer? Oh, my first use of computer was at, uh, in high school where we, at the end of my, uh, uh, you know, that was kind of funky, we, we started programming in BASIC yes. in the IT classes, and it was on paper. It was with pencil and paper. So basically, we were writing code on a piece of paper. Oh, yes. And I still know that, that, that famous moment when the first computers arrived at school, and we, for the very first time, were able to actually run a program. <laughs> <laughs> If you think about it, it's like, Holy crap. <laughs> okay. so, and I liked it, but that was the only exposure I had. And the thing is, you need to do a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of experimentation. And I think just having access to some IT at school will not cut it. You need more. Yeah. And in those days, a computer was a very expensive thing. That's right. And at home, we didn't have that, uh, that much money. So basically, my very first own computer was a 386 with uh, four megabytes of RAM and a whooping 100 megabyte disk. And that was quite a nice machine at that time. Do you and know when, I, when was that? Do you know that? Do you remember? The 90s, I guess, huh? Yeah, the early 90s, somewhere. The early 90s. And so... that's what I started using for uh, my studies, you know, typing, uh, your, writing your thesis, doing Excel calculations for your scientific research. Uh, then during uh, the, uh, the, my, my university years, my thesis was uh, around cell cellular cultures with uh, toxic metals, and we needed to count stuff in, in cell cultures, and that okay. was done with Im an image analysis uh, system based on cameras, photographs, and also some software to calculate that. So that was my first exposure to the value of IT, Uh, to a process, not just, you know, I like IT, I like tinkering with computers, I like the, the, the things that go bleep and, and give me green and, and red lights. You know, if, if you're a geek, you like that sort of stuff. But that was the first time, like, hey, wait a minute, this is actually quite impressive. Because a couple of years ago, before they had a computer, how do you calculate all those thousands and thousands of results that was becoming a problem? Or it was only... Uh, An, uh, an availability to, to, the, to the rich labs and the, and, the, and the big labs who had the money to have a mainframe and computer time, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, Microsoft, uh, uh, DOS, and Windows gave certain amounts of compute power, even if it was, in our standards of today, very limited. Uh, the amount of automation we got done in Excel If you if you thought about it versus six years before where you I basically had almost nothing, yeah, was 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 mind boggling. It was it was a breakthrough for us that we could do that. Those were the early days for us. I still remember getting internet and email. <laughs> I was like, wow, look at this! Instead of writing a letter to some person in a university in 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 the USA and hoping to get a reply some somewhere. Some or weeks heaven later, forbid, trying, <laughs> yeah, or, or heaven forbid, trying to get your authorization to pick up the phone and make an international phone call. <laughs> I mean, no, you could just send the mail; it would arrive there within seconds, minutes. And if if the if the time zones were 
a bit aligned. You might even get a reply within a couple of hours. It was like, oh. Yeah, that, uh, there is, yeah. there's changed a lot in the last 30 years, maybe. Yeah. We are now doing Absolutely. a Skype interview. You are sitting in Belgium and I'm sitting in Germany and we are talking like face to face, right? Absolutely. It's unbelievable. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. The, the power and, the, and the, the capabilities we have at our hands and we are just even, let's, let's, let's ignore the fact that we work in IT. But you, you could be a florist and I could be uh, a botanist <laughs> having this discussion. Yeah. With the same technology, that's right. You don't have to have a PhD or a civil engineering degree in mathematics and compute to be able to use all this technology, right? I mean, that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Your your mother could be using this to talk to yeah. her grandson. Yeah. At yeah. New Year's Day to say hi, hi, grandma. Yeah. And uh, it's, like, wow. it's going it's going further with Skype Skype translation in real time. We saw that uh, at Ignite uh, or one where was it? I I don't know. Remember, uh, really crazy stuff. But I, we are drifting away from my question, so I will come back. Oh, so you, <laughs> your first computer was a three. Three eighty-six, yes, and I see One some nice computers uh, in in the back there. To your ah yes, you this is your home lab, right? Home. This is the home lab, yes. Yeah, this so... is the home lab. This is where it happens. This is where I test all the stuff that isn't in the cloud yet, and that's still a significant part of of the job actually. Uh, my, I, I I love tinkering with computers. I love the fact that. Uh, you know, if, if you're a bit uh, connected in the industry, you know where to find old material people discard and that you can use for your lab. And I like the fact that you can do that. It just takes your time and effort. Uh, and once you have it, you can use it for X amount of time or even years uh, before it becomes totally obsolete. And for me, that was always the easiest way to, uh, to learn and to experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, when the cloud came along, that was a bit harder to do and test and experiment with because it's a pay-as-you-go system. And it's a, it's a lot easier to convince your boss that you have those two old computers or that old switch that they're going to chuck out anyway than to tell them, can I have a Visa card and pay a couple of hundred of euros per month just to tinker around in Azure? It's like, huh? No. <laughs> like, can I have that old computer? Oh, sure. Glad to get rid of it. Okay. So that was kind of a of a, of a trans, transition you had to make. Uh, how how do we get how do we get the the lab time in Azure when there's a credit card involved, right? Mm. Because this is this has already been paid for. It's it's done. It's, it's over. You know. It's it's how do, who do you call it in business terms in English? It's written off, right? Yeah, written off. Uh, the expenses have been have been booked. Everybody's happy. It's it's all junk to some people, whilst it's very useful to some others, like in a home lab. That's right. Uh, but with Azure, it's like, oh, you wanna you wanna do compute time here? Where's the, here's the credit card? <laughs> it's like, hi boss, I need a credit card. No, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a of a of a new way of talking about uh, training and how to how to learn with with the bosses. Yeah, that and that that's been fixed by now. You have you have the, the you have these uh, corporate subscriptions for Azure where you can just consume some of the of the of the of the money they've paid uh, or or they bought already in Azure just for experimenting. Uh, but still, it's it's it 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 was a bit of a. Of a paradigm shift in order to get to get to that point. Yeah, and you can't do ev everything we need to do in infrastructure in Azure. So if you no. play with clusters or with Hyper-V clusters, that's not possible at least yet. Yeah, yeah. and also there's, there's other challenges. One of the challenges I had to fix uh, was uh, I want a VPN from uh, from my home lab to Azure. Yeah, because a lot of scenarios in hybrid require that you have some kind of connectivity between the cloud and on-premises. You want to start playing with ADFS and Geosync, and you want to do some, uh, let's say, uh, failover testing between the cloud and on-premises. You want to do some geological, uh, geographical load balancing, all, all those kinds of needs, funny things to do. Well, it's going to require that you have that connectivity. And what you used to be able to do with your consumer grade, uh, there's my phone ringing, I'll ignore that for now. Uh, what you used to be able to do with your with your 
consumer grade uh, modem or router uh, setting up a VPN to a cloud provider hmm, that isn't going to fly so how do I fix this or you can fix this if you buy this little piece of equipment and it's like hmm that's quite that's a nice sum of money for my home <laughs> It has some challenges. Yeah. yeah, and that's one of the problems uh, that we have as community uh, people. We, and at least as infrastructure people, we have to have the stuff. We need money for that. We are playing with hardware, we are playing with virtualization, we are playing with storage and so on. And uh, many people forget how hard it is to ha to have a home lab or in my company, we are a small company, we need a lot of things to play with and uh, it's, it, it, it is easier in Azure, of course, but Azure, you have to pay for it, right? Uh, and in well, a home it, lab, if you get old stuff... Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 also the the uh, the availability and the the ability to use it. I mean, uh, even if you could get, uh, let's say, a SAN and 10 gigabit networking and servers for free, uh, somebody still has to run it, pay for the power and yeah. the cooling, or you know, there is a cost involved. And for a home lab, that's quite challenging, of course. I know some people uh, online who do that. Uh, I just hope they make a hell of a lot more money than I do because I, I'd go broke running that at home. Uh, but on the other hand, what also surprises me is that I have tested more scenarios in my little home lab here than a lot of companies have ever tested in their environment because I've noticed as well when you talk to people at, uh, at conferences where you're presenting or attending and they talk oh that's so neat you get to do this well I do have a nice home lab that I invest a lot of time in even if it is not enterprise grade hardware far from but on the other hand I've always managed to convince the bosses look if you're going to invest X amount of, of euros or dollars into mission critical hardware and infrastructure. At least set apart a little piece of that budget to make sure that we have some hardware to play and test with. Mm. And playing is perhaps the wrong word, but the proving grounds, you know, help your people to understand to the best of their capabilities what they are using to run the company. And I have found that it was always uh, a very smart thing to do because the return on investment is humongous. And I mean that. If I look back over the years, what we've done with Hyper-V, 10 gigabit, ODX, OnMap, uh, VMQ, VRSS, all those technologies, we are leveraging them with success in production. But it is thanks to the fact that we have been able to vet and test and try it out and make sure, look, this works for us in our environment. Even now, if we have a new, if you have patches, if we have to test out something new, we have a couple of nodes we can use as a cluster where we can assign 10 gigabit to test out that new driver, the new firmware, the new network card. We can really vet what we're going to do and use in production. And we and it takes effort, it takes time, and of course the, the initial investment is there. But when I look at all the problems, the downtime, the cost of trying to fix all that, be, be after the fact that it has happened, that's in production, that hurts your business, that hurts your productivity. Uh, in, in retrospect, if you look at it, investing in some lab equipment is always a very smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. In the whole big scheme of things, if you look how much one employee costs a business per year, and if you have a couple of hundreds to thousands of employees, and if you know how much an office costs and, and, and a data center costs and all the licensing around it costs, then you have to realize that spending potentially a couple of tens of thousands of euros every year, every X years, I mean, is actually not that big a deal in the big picture of things. I'm, I'm with you. But of course... But, but it can be a very hard sell. And I have the, the impression that the, the more you work with IT companies, the harder it gets. Yeah. This, is, this is a funny anecdote. We've had, we've had a, 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 a big project for a database development with a Belgium uh, systems integrator or you know, an IT company. And they needed to develop database stuff for us. And they come to us, look, the thing we need to develop for you, this is, this is big stuff. I said, yes, yes, this is big stuff. It's important. That's why we pay you, right, to, be, to do the good job. Well, you can't expect us to have the hardware to 
because that, this was in the era before virtualization really took off. You can't you can't expect us to have the hardware to to run this uh, development database on. And we're like, what do you mean? You're you're you're, you're a professional IT company. You deliver you you offer uh, database development services to your customers. That's what you do for a living. What do you mean you don't have the hardware to run the, <laughs> the, the development database on? So no, we don't. That's like if it doesn't work on the on the cheapest, lousiest PC, uh, we can't help you. So basically, we delivered the server to them to 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 be able to do the project, and they yeah. they kept it for a year, year and a half, perhaps even two years. I don't even remember. But the real shocker was one day we got it back, and we got it back, and they wanted us to take the server into our domain. And let the the application run. <laughs> so I so I said to the to the guys, wait a minute, I need to check this machine before I do that. And I was getting pretty late in the in the afternoon, so I said I need to check this machine. No, no way, I'm going to just take a machine where the Windows deployment has been out of our control for X amount of years and put it into the network. So we check it. It turns out to be chock full of malware and viruses and worms, whatever you want. <laughs> And I'm like, what the hell happened here? Well, they used it to download some stuff probably as well next to database development. So I said, no, 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 no. This machine is going to be totally wiped, upgraded in firmware. We're going to reinstall it, and then we'll use it in the production. So the PM was like, oh, this is a waste of time. I said, no way. We're not doing this. So then we do that, we try to run the installer, the installer doesn't work, so you have to call the developer at night, it's getting <laughs> 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock at night, the PM is, is, is get, he's getting steam from his ears, I'm pretty pissed off as a customer, I've given them my hardware, I've given them my services, I, they, they bring it back uh, with malware, I'm wasting my time, I mean, I'm like, holy crap, the IT industry sometimes... <laughs> Really? Really? <laughs> I I exactly know what you mean. I have uh, not the same experience, but uh, I I work in IT for a long time, and uh, I know these things. I know these things, uh, and I think it's getting worse. You said it before; it's getting worse. But let's talk about some other things here, and uh, not talking about anecdotes with people who seem to work in IT but not really work in IT. <laughs> so, Didier. <laughs> I have a question for you. <coughs> so, what technology influenced your life most? Hmm. My pers personally, I would have to say uh, virtualization. Virtualization. Why is that? Virtual. If you, if you, because it's probably that technology that exposed me to the most opportunities. Uh, and gave me all those uh, very nice options and, and opportunities to attend uh, conferences, become a public speaker on the subject, to become an MVP, to become a Veeam Vanguard. I mean, it's not just a technology that will do that for you, of course. But if you have to say, on the whole, which technology was the most impactful in, in that, in that uh, respect, I think it should be virtualization. What has what has taught me a lot in IT, uh, the fact that I have always uh, endeavored to own the entire stack. I have always had uh, an almost visceral, uh, uh, you know, uh, objection to being dependent on silos. Mm -hmm. I mean, all those discussions about people, you have to break the silo, you have to talk to the storage team, the storage team has to talk to the network team, the network team has to talk to the security team, and I'm like, I don't want any of that. If I'm going to run IT, we're going to own the stack. And there's no, the storage team said this, or the network team said that, dudes, this is the team. There is no storage team. There is no network team. This is the team. And you'd better all work together and talk together. And there's not no, no such thing like, perhaps we'll get a response from the network team next month. No, 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 no. And that, that makes for success. And I, and I truly believe that smaller IT projects that are uh, limited in scope uh, and, and in uh, dollar amount and in 
human resources that headcount, but are very focused and that own their entire stack from beginning to end and just have multiple of those. Let them work and collaborate together as much as possible. But I think uh, you can move a lot quicker and achieve a lot more faster at, at less cost with better results than with the giant, um, huge IT projects that only the analysis of the entire problem will take you a year and then the design is going to take a year and then it's going to take a year to deploy and by the time they deploy there's two new versions of whatever you're using and I don't like that. Mm. I, I don't see this as a, as a viable or economically sensible approach in this day and age. I have this, it's not a hard rule, it's not written in stone somewhere on my desk, but I have this rule like if I cannot get an idea into production within a year and start lev uh, benefiting from it, we need to think really hard if, we, if we're even going to do it. Mm. I work for a lot of hosters and enterprises in Germany, as you know, and I see these silos a lot. Actually, it's the norm. There are not quite many companies who have not these silos. Uh, and I, I, I think you're absolutely right. If you own the whole stack, that's the, be the better approach. But you have to be a generalist. Do you know what I mean? You have to know networking, storage, virtualization, even Windows Server, uh, everything, uh, and you don't fee find many people who who can do all the stuff because it's so much uh, in the moment. What, what do there you is think a about lot. that? But, but, well, let's let's face it. No ma no man is an island, and nobody knows everything. Right? Mm -hmm. That's that's a given. Now, owning the entire stack doesn't know, doesn't necessarily mean that one person should be able to know and do everything. Owning the stack means that as a group, mm -hmm. and that group shouldn't be 500 people large because then you get the silos and the, and, and, and the, and the politics around it again. But that, sh that group should be small enough to make it work, big enough to make it work, basically. But those people should be a unit, a cohesive unit that is there for only one purpose, to help each other achieve the, 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 the goals. And there might be a person in there who knows most about networking, most about storage. Mm -hmm. Some will be weaker in one point or another. Uh, but they should all be highly skilled, highly motivated, and they can have their own strengths and weaknesses. That's not a problem. You have to cross-training by collaborating and working together. I mean, I always... No, and that's not me. It was a colleague of mine, basically, who's dead by, uh, anyway, at this moment, unfortunately, because he was a brilliant guy. But he once said in, in a meeting when people were discussing, oh, my God, we're losing the cohesiveness of the teams, blah, 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 drama, drama. We need a, uh, we need a, a team building activity. We need to go to the Ardennes and, and kayak together and, <laughs> and jump off a cliff or whatever. And he was like, I, I have this one suggestion for a very good, nice team building effort. And everybody looked like, yes. And he says, just work together and get the project done. <laughs> That's, that's like, I mean, there was a lot of wisdom in that one. Yeah, uh, but but I think I think if you, if you hit a if you hit a, a point where the expertise is so uh, scarce and so limited that you cannot do it yourself anymore, that's when you should bring in a consultant for highly specialized sh highly specialized short term engagements. Mm -hmm. I always have. A wariness for projects that have consultants that you need to have around for years. That's not how you should, you should use expertise and consultancy. Yeah. Uh, I don't like it. And secondly, and this is sounds a bit strange to some people, but you should only build solutions using components and technologies that are only as complex as that you can manage. Because no matter how smart you are, how much money you have, you can always build a system that gets so complex and so difficult to manage and tweak or upgrade that you're going to paint yourself into a corner, no matter how much money you have. So when you design things, you should be able to design it that it has all the complexity that it needs, but not a drop more. Okay. 
it's maintainable, it's upgradable, it's sustainable, and it doesn't require uh, experts and consultants that cost you $2,000 per day just to get it working. Forget it. You can do the extra effort in money and in time by acquiring expertise for particular parts of your project if and when needed. It's like building something that's completely dependent on the highest skilled peoples in the world. I mean, I'm not NASA. Mm. I'm not running the space. I'm not sending people to Mars. If, if that becomes my requirement to get something done, I'm not doing my job right, am I? Okay, yeah, you're right. Nice that's answer. So you said virtualization is the technology that influenced your life most. So coming back to our expertise uh, in Windows Server, which feature um, do you like in Windows Server the best? And you can include the stuff that is coming. Question. Yes. Which technology? Which, no, feature? which feature? In, in our, so in Hyper-V, in Windows Server, in storage, in uh, networking, what do you like best in the moment? At the moment? Oh, if, I can, moment. if I can just... Not in two months, no. I, <laughs> at the moment, I'm really playing with RUFS to see where it can take me. Yeah. Because I like what they are doing with... Uh, you know, RUFS, it got a lot of attention when two, Windows 2012 came, came along. And there was some uh, interest generated, and then it quietly died down because it had some limitations left and right, and you know. And then all of a sudden, with 2016, it gets this new boost in attention, especially due to the uh, the storage spaces direct story around RUFS. Mm -hmm. uh, you also see these these new capabilities in RUFS that other applications and applications can be a hypervisor or a storage system, whatever, can leverage. Mm -hmm. to, to, to do almost magical uh, things with, with data and, and storage. And, and then, then, it, then it's like, wow. So, hey, this, this, it's like it's got its second boost, you know, its mm -hmm. second wave of interest. And I hope this time they, they push it beyond uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the bar that people really start using it. And with Storage Spaces Direct, of course, that's a no-brainer. But I, but I think it has uh, applicabilities and, and, and will deliver opportunities way beyond just Storage Spaces Direct. So I hope, I hope they will push it high enough over the bar so that we can start using it in a wider, in a wider area of, uh, of use cases. Uh, so that's one that's on my mind at the moment, really. And another one that's really on my mind is uh, storage class policies because I really like what they're doing there. Uh, the, f the fact that you can do it uh, on a file share but also on block level storage with a CSV, the fact that you get easy insight into what's happening uh, on the LAN level and the virtual machine level on your uh, Hyper-V cluster, it's a very nice capability to have, uh, especially for people who have, let's say, perhaps the, the lowest ends of the storage solution that you can have. And if that's what you need and that's what you can afford, there's nothing wrong with that. But I've always liked, uh, I might not be a, the biggest fan of the trickle-down economy uh, in, 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 let's say, in society. But when I look at technology and I see Microsoft developing all these capabilities within their uh, stack, and I look at I don't I don't look at it like wow, that's nice. Uh, if I was a, a a public cloud provider, I would love it. I'm always looking around like what can I use here for my benefit in my environment for my needs. And I see these technologies trickle down. I mean, look look at look at what they did in uh, in 2012 uh, 2012 or two with uh, dynamically expanding VAGXs. The for, the performance became very good. Yeah. Right, and all of a sudden, people who are uh, limited to, let's say, non-tin uh, provisioning physical storage, still have a way to get uh, storage optimization just at the virtual level. The same thing with Unmap. Unmap just oh, at they, the they, virtual they, level. Now you're going over feature and feature and feature. <laughs> I asked you about <laughs> what do you Sorry. like? Sorry. Yes, it's very. 
it's so you, you told, to you told us RFS. It's it's a new um, Microsoft file system that's around uh, till 2012 now, and it will be huge in 2016. And you mentioned uh, storage costs. This uh, so quality of so service for storage also very that's nice. That's the policies, the policies, right? The, pol the, the policy, yeah, the storage course policies, right? Cool features. So my next question, question for you is: now you can talk about some stuff that you are really <laughs> using. What feature uh, is most useful in your business? And this uh, can't be 2016 because you no, have no, to no, use there's it. a couple of them. A couple. What, okay. what has made a trip? What has made a tremendous difference for us is ODX. Yeah. If you have a storage system that or array that supports that and works well, it's a godsend. So please explain Both for the virtualization. What, is it, what it does. ODX, basically, it is offloading your data, copying, moving actions uh, that are uh, of the data that's on your storage array to that storage array. So basically, you're not unnecessarily copying or moving data around. If it's already on the storage system and it just has to go to another place on the storage system, there, there can be efficiencies by letting the storage system do that behind the scenes and just uh, making that experience uh, transparent to you. You don't notice you're doing anything different, but under the hood, magic is happening and you are seeing a, a tremendous performance benefit. Okay. So ODX is one of those things that for us, really, it has worked out brilliantly, both in the virtualization layer and the physical layer. Because it, it is about more than just Hyper-V, let me tell you that. You can do really nice things with it. And okay. Uh, other stuff that we really, really leverage is OnMap for for uh, uh, storage efficiencies with our storage arrays. Uh, we have an environment that's very volatile in data. We're, we're, the, we're the type of organization where, where a PM can come to your desk and say, can I have 10 terabytes of storage by tomorrow, please? And it can also happen that, oh, I'm going to delete some storage and hey, ploof. All of a sudden, you've got six terabytes of storage again. <laughs> and that happens on and off. So we're volatile. Yeah. Uh, it's, the, it's the nature of the business. I'm not saying that this is a, a business model everybody should follow, but it's like saying that it's not because we can use a Ferrari because we're a Formula One racing company or something that you should buy a, a, a Formula One racing car, right? You just have to think about it. What, I, what business am I in? What are my needs? Do I need a bus? Do I need a van? Or do I need a, a, a personal car to be a taxi company? It differs. Uh, but OnMap is important to us. That's why I, I was always kind of on the, on the forefront of uh, complaining to people when they turned it off. <laughs> although, the, all, all, although the reasons for turning it off yeah. were very, let's say, uh, uh, let's, uh, justified because, well, it was causing issues. But <laughs> turning it off to me is not a solution, right? So <laughs> let's, let's state that one for the record again. <laughs> Fix it. Uh, I know what you mean. And, <laughs> One and the other <laughs> okay. And the, the other technologies that have been tremendous for us, and basically that's where my some people, some some fellow MVPs uh, who live in Ireland and are <laughs> called Aiden as a first name and Finn as the second name, <laughs> have even stated that that was that was the biggest cause of my fame was I was very early at doing 10 gigabit. Yeah. But that has been such. Uh, that has had such a positive impact on our environment. Uh, and then leveraging the VMQ, uh, the DVMQ, and now with 2012 R2, the virtual RSS, in an environment that's highly, highly virtualized and where you move data around a lot, it makes a huge difference. So and uh, <laughs> did you, you gave us a couple of... Uh, yeah. technologies or features, so you, now you have to decide which one had, had the greatest impact in your business. Well, this is like asking what your favorite dish is. There is no such thing as a favorite <laughs> favorite dish. There are so many good dishes, and, yes, and the combination yeah. of those flavors make it... Even better, yeah. I know. <laughs> feature. Very bad for, for our... ODX, <laughs> network stuff. If, if, if I have to choose between all of them, yeah, the biggest one... Uh, 10 gigabit networking and the advanced features. 
okay. if and when they work. And, uh, and that goes for any advanced technology. It has to work and be reliable. Okay. And you, you did a nice work on that. Uh, there are many blog posts on your site about uh, 10 gigabit and also ODX and the uh, Unmap. And we had some showcasts about that and uh, demo also. the stuff, right? Okay. Yeah. So now I have asked you some of those questions. <coughs> um, you are wearing a Weem sweatshirt. So we know you are a Microsoft MVP. Uh, yes. You told us already you are a Vanguard, a Veeam Vanguard, and uh, you are also a Dell Tech Center rock star. Yes. So what? And I'm a member of the Belgium Microsoft Extended Experts team. Oh, sorry, I didn't that's, know. It. I know that, but I didn't mention it. Yeah. So, so that's what? basically all, all my all my <laughs> claims to fame there. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that. What what um, does these how you call it awards mean to you? Have they It's, changed something uh, uh, in your professional life or in your personal life? Uh, I'm going to make the distinction here between my job and my professional life because the job is something that is something you do and everybody of us has to do to make a living. Yeah. Uh, and uh, not everything you do in a community or just for yourself because you are motivated and you want to learn and you're just passionate about technology is something that will translate into promotion or recognition at work in your job. Mm -hmm. uh, that that just doesn't happen. If if you if you do this kind of community work and you do this effort only to gain a promotion or an increase in wage, I think you're going to be very disappointed. Yeah, and I and am. You I'm, might I, be I'm my own boss, and it doesn't help me. <laughs> <laughs> But you are, you don't you don't give yourself a raise. So how, how, no. <laughs> how sad is that actually? <laughs> But sorry, but, but it, you know, I mean, there, there are people who, who, who will benefit from it, of course, uh, but it's far from a guarantee, and I think it's a bad motivation to do it. Uh, and if, if it doesn't happen, you're going to quit. I mean, it's, it's, it, I call it external motivation, and it's always a lot worse than in, intrinsic uh, motivation to do something. On the other hand, professionally, uh, the opportunities, those awards have given me to learn, grow, interact with the community, meet so many talented, passionate, knowledgeable, experienced people is just tremendous and amazing. And uh, you have to be willing and able to, to, to make use of those uh, opportunities. That means investing some time because some conferences will take you away in the weekends. Uh, they will cost you a bit of money. If you're lucky, your boss wants to sponsor that completely or partially. Sometimes you will invest some of your own money, just like you invest some of your own time. Uh, is that worth it? If you look at it from a pure dollar perspective or euro perspective, and you say, uh, everything I do has to translate into a euro, then for many people it will, it will probably not be worth it because you will be paid X amount of dollars whether you go to that conference or not, whether you learn something or not. On the other hand, if you look at your personal evolution, your, 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 develop, your personal development, your ability to, to learn and grow and adapt to a changing world, because that's also something you have to consider. The world is moving ahead, and if you're standing still, just thinking about, hmm, will this get me another dollar in the bank or not? Mm -hmm. Then you might find out that five or ten years later, you'll find a lot less dollars on the bank because somebody <laughs> is like, what do you actually do for us? You know, so it's 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 been amazing. It's been it's been groundbreaking in opening up opportunities, and and then you just have to jump at the opportunities. Uh, is that sometimes frustrating? Yes, because there are sometimes many opportunities, and you can't make use of all of them okay. due to lack of time and the lack of money. <laughs> if 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 I was independently wealthy. I might have done a bit more conferences this year in a bit more locations around the world. And, and, but sometimes people seem to think like that time for 
MVPs or, or rock stars or whatever it is is endless and uh, money grows on on some sort of a special tree for us so that's not true either you know and and, and you will probably know this even better than I am I, I can have my frustrations as an employee you can have your frustrations as a business owner but one of the one of the most frustrating things I have found in ICT is and, and it only becomes more apparent uh, due to the speed at which things move in this industry, is it takes a very uh, profound, sustained effort to ac acquire expertise. And almost in direct relation to that, it becomes ever harder to valorize, market that expertise to make a living. So, in my opinion, uh, when people complain to me that, we, that they can't find the, the, the qualified personnel, I'm like, one, maybe, uh, but are you willing to pay for it? Because, I mean, they always say you get the government you elect, you get the government you deserve, perhaps you get the employees you deserve. I'm not saying it's easy as an employer to pay top dollar for every employee you, you need, but there is this checks and balances, and you cannot want to get to pay low wages and get the top experts. Mm -hmm. Because what what are you building then? A, a company based on on mediocre skill sets that need to hire consultants for every step they do, and that costs money as well. I mean, there is there is a bit of an irrationality in the entire game of expertise versus versus uh, versus acquiring it versus selling it or or buying it. And as a, and as a business owner, I'm pretty sure because you're not the only business owner I know that. It's it's a pretty big issue to be able to acquire the expertise, market expertise, and make sure that at the end of the month the bills are paid, and basically, at least you can afford to buy yourself a new pair of shoes when the old ones are worn out, right? I mean, if if you do to if you go through all that effort, no matter how passionate you are, it's kind of nice to be able to to pay the bills and have something left over to to make a trip and take your wife to 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 on a holiday. Yeah. So uh, when you spoke about uh, um, the employee, how people are employed and paid for specialists, I remember a blog post of Didier uh, where the normally so polite Didier was not so polite or not, uh, at least you can, you could read it between the lines. You were very angry uh, uh, about something that happened to you. Uh, uh, um, people want your expertise for free, I remember. Do you have oh, that? I, I think they get a yeah, yeah, I don't have that block open, uh, or, or do I have that often? But luckily, not that often. Luckily, yeah. not that often, because basically, I think anybody who who really interacts with us and knows us, and and works with us in the community, knows that we share a lot. Yeah, I mean, uh, if and and that works in all directions. I mean, if one of my MVP buddies or Veeam Vanguards is in trouble and they ping me and they say, do you know anything about it? Can you help? I'll respond. And if it is really something that I, that I know something about or think, hey, wait a minute, you might be hitting this issue, we just share that information. Yeah. And I think, and I think in that way, that's something both uh, employers as employees should realize. That's how the world works. I mean, this idea that you can hoard knowledge within your own little company and never share it. That might have been a good plan in the 60s when you had to go to the library to find a picture of a butterfly. Yeah. But now I open up Google and more information that an entire generation will ever be able to process, let alone read, you know I mean, and just really process that information is out there. And the only way to, to cope with it, the only way to really have all the, the the understanding and the knowledge and the help you need to make things work is sharing. Yeah. And 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 that will happen. I mean, I'm often I'm often I'm often flabbergasted when I see what I call Dilbert like life at, at companies. It's like, oh, we need to develop skill sets and we need to develop interaction between employees. 
And I'm like, Jesus, boss, perhaps you should come down to the work floor and see the interaction that, that goes on on a daily basis <laughs> between, between people in different countries, on, in other parts of the world, where, where I answer a question or ask a question to a fellow community member and we all help each other out. I mean, when you hire a passionate, community-minded employee in IT, you are hiring his entire network, all the people he knows, all the skills they have. It's a giant mesh of knowledge and expertise that is constantly evolving and growing. Mm, that's and right. that is worth something. And when a boss says to me, for example, like, oh, why would I spend money for my employee to go to a conference? He's going to go to a party, and he's going to get drunk, and he's going to... Uh, talk a lot, but what does it give me? Well, he's not just going to the party. He's not just going to get drunk. He's not just going to talk and do nothing with that information. He's going to meet people. He's going to network. He's going to acquire uh, a network, knowledge, uh, help, assistance. He's growing as a person. He's growing as a professional, and that will pay itself back. Now, does that mean that you have to send every employee to every possible conference you can? No. But sometimes I think, like, it is not as easy as spending X amount of dollars for training or for a conference to make people work to the maximum of their ability. You have to know your people. You have to know what they mean to you, what they do for you. You have to know their personalities. And some people will deliver the most return on investment if you give them some money for an Azure subscription or some hardware to play with. Some other peoples will benefit the most from a, from a more traditional uh, teaching experience with, like, say, a, a Hyper-V training course. Because different types of people learn in different ways. Yeah. Some like to think on their own. Some uh, are a lot more productive in learning when they get some instruction. It all differs. So it's not like, here's the magic five rules. If you follow these five rules, all your employees will be top level. No, it doesn't work that way. I have, I have, I have very, very good colleagues, but they're all very, very different. And yeah. basically, I think that's, that's, that's how the team works. I think the team existing out of five DJs would be boring. We'd constantly be fighting amongst each other. I don't know. But that wouldn't work. <laughs> that wouldn't work, no. Yeah. Oh, you're right. You're right. Different people, uh, different skills. It's the right uh, recipe. So, Didier, um, we are approaching the one hour mark and I want to have the podcast below one hour so um, where can the viewers or uh, the people who, who hear the podcast uh, learn more about DT? Where do they find you in the internet? Oh, in the internet, I'm very easy to find so at working hard in IT is my Twitter handle Yeah, and if you just remember working hard in IT, type it into your favorite browser. You'll find a lot of hits to my blog and my tweets and some of the, the videos we've done or that I've done on Vimeo. So just working hard in IT, that's that's the word you need to remember. And then you'll find my blog, which is uh, blog.workinghardinit.work and uh, my Twitter handle. And from there, if you don't find me then, you might have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Didier. Uh, this was a nice conversation. Uh, I love to do that, and I'm looking forward to our next Hyper-V Amigo showcast that will come soon, maybe one this month, right? And we maybe will talk about uh, um, ReFS. What do you think about that? Sounds like a great plan. Okay. Bye, Didier. Bye-bye, Carson. Bye.